on to this awesome paper. Uh, so just a refresher, I know John posted some of my notes on continuing fractions and ergodic theory, but for those who didn't read them or didn't know they existed. Uh, so continued fractions, the regular continued fractions, which is what I'm going to talk about, are a way to represent positive real numbers um, as a fraction within a fraction. Uh, so here we have, there we go, a i r integers. The first one is allowed to be zero and the rest are greater than or equal to one. And the negative numbers, you just take the absolute value and put a minus sign out front of whatever you get. This is going to terminate if and only if x is rational. Um, you can convince yourself that. Um, and irrationals, it's unique. Rationals are not unique because we could do n is n minus 1 plus 1 over 1. Uh, so <laughs> we have a problem there. But other than that, we're fine. And then just some playing around with definitions. You can kind of do 1 over something that acts as a either right or left shift, depending on what you whether there's a 0 um, as your integer part or not. So you just kind of play around with fractions. It's not a complicated math, but it's a little confusing when you start playing with them for the first time. But this is an ergodic theory seminar. We want to do some ergodic theory. Um, there you go. So we define a map from zero to one, um, where you take one over x and you subtract off the floor of one over x, which is either the same thing as taking the fractional part of x. Um, sometimes it's written that way or you have one over x minus k, where x is in this interval, one over k plus one to one over k. If you rewrite the floor function, this is what you find. Um, we do want it to be defined at zero, so we just say t of zero is zero. And yep, this gives some of this, uh, some branches of nine or 10 of them, uh, look like this, this will be infinitely many, and for each 1 over k plus 1, 1 over k maps onto uh, 0, 1. Should be defined, so 1's the open interval. And here, this is k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3, etc. And so this actually corresponds to the first digit of the continued fraction expansion. And if you write them at this, so if we, instead of plugging in real numbers, you just plug in your sequence of continued fraction digits, you get the now left, this one is definitely the left shift map. Um, and because everything's between zero and one, we repress the zero because it doesn't add any information. It just kind of looks annoying. Uh, but this is, you can see from the dot, 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 or the definition of our cylinders, that this is, uh, it, but we have infinite to one, which is kind of annoying to work with. Uh, in this case, it's not that bad. You can prove things about this map just fine. The, uh, maybe not ergodic, but certainly an invariant measure, you can handle Gauss did it, so just from this map, no one's quite sure how, but it's certainly doable. I think the, I think ergodicity does require, at least all of the nice proofs I've seen require the next step, which is we define a natural extension. This is also called an invertible extension, depending on who you're talking to, um, which is, in this case, we just take the unit square. And the first digit, so the first place here, this x is just exactly what we had before. Uh, and for 
where we're not worried about dividing by zero, we put the inverse in the y coordinate. And then when we are worried about dividing by zero, we just force it to be invertible. And so this has the effect if you throw the continued fraction expansion down that we take this first digit and we move it of x and we move it to the first digit of y. So if you were to actually write this out as an infinite string in the order of the subscripts and not broken up at x and y, this is again the shift map. And now we're going to throw some geometry on here. And this is where I um, now have some really nice pictures that we didn't have back, well, a year ago, but also in when this paper was published in 84. Um, first, we'll start with what we did have, which is we're going to work on the upper half plane. And we're going to act by PSL2Z, um, where ABCD is acts on Z by this Mobius transformation, AZ plus B over CZ plus D. Um, and the shaded area is our non-standard fundamental domain. This is one of the things that series did was kind of shift over the uh, fundamental domain here. And omega is where those geodesics intersect, which is one plus I root three over two. And this is where I think I don't have the slides on the website because those are a PDF, but I stole some animations from Wikipedia, which uh, this is an animation, if it's coming through, otherwise, um, of Z plus one, shifts everything to the right one. Uh, and then, that's, it's kind of nice to watch, but it's not as exciting as the other one, which is cartwheeling here as one over Z. Um, and you can kind of see how it moves that entire upper half plane, if the animation's coming through. Um, and then these two transformations generate all of PSL2Z. So, and also maybe can start to see if you like do Z plus one a bunch of times and then one over Z that kind of looks like doing like a digit of the continued fraction, sort of. Um, I'm not gonna get into the like, actual technical arguments, but that's kind of a thought process of what's going on here. But I now have this nice, almost almost really nice representation of the modular surface. Um, so this is one view, I'll show another view, a second of what you get if you glue all of the vertical edges together. Um, so this is not, this is not closed. <laughs> um, if we, this is not quite, but then this one where we try with the shading, I can try and drag Mathematica around so you can see what's going on. Uh, this one's not measured correctly, but you get something like this. If you try to actually glue up that fundamental domain into a surface, we get something some similar to these. And I should be able to, yes. Oops. Um, if I can get my mouse on the, there we go. Should be able to drag it around in Mathematica to show a little better. Kind of what the surface looks like. This is, this is certainly a work in progress with uh, Steve Trettel of trying to get this thing. Actually, this is not isomorph isometric, but it's close to kind of see what's going on. And this is a model of the space we're going to work on that I think really helps see what's going on. I have more pictures that I've drawn on in later slides. There we go. So 
what is the idea here um, from series? Um, so we're going to act on PSL2Z. This is essentially a copy of the previous slide. Um, and if we act on this fundamental domain by S is 0, minus 1, 1. Yeah, 1, minus 1. That should have determinant 1. Then you end up with S of this fundamental, let's try to highlight that a little better. This fundamental domain is some, this, all right, kind of extra chunk. So if this is F, this is S of F. I can't do a math frac very well. And then this other bit that give of the, ideal triangle is s squared of f. So the idea is we act on this and now we take this whole triangle to get our tessellation. Um, and this is why we wanted to use the non-standard fundamental domain. And this gives what we call the fairy tessellation, uh, which you connect two rational numbers, if and only if they have this determinant one condition, so whether it's plus or minus one depends on which one's larger and which one's smaller. Um, and this is the first few steps. The other way of generating this is you draw a vertical line. So maybe I should just say, in case people are not as familiar with hyperbolic geometry, uh, the geodesics look like uh, semicircles. Centered on the x or real axis. Uh, and then these vertical ones are infinite radius. So the fairy tessellation version of generating this is that you put a vertical line at every integer, and then you connect every integer to the one on either side of it. And then you connect every integer to the denominator two fraction on either side of it. And then the next step is what I have here, which is you connect all of those to the denominator three, one on either side of whichever, either integer or half integer that you have here. So this is level three. Uh, and then you keep going infinitely, but that becomes very hard to draw. So we stop at some point. And we're going to work on top of this because even though we do now have some nice sort of nice approximation of what the surface looks like, much nicer to draw on top of two dimensional things, flat two dimensional things. So one thing that's really nice about hyper, uh, hyperbolic geometry, whether you're working in the disk model or the upper half plane model, is that geodesics are unique. Um, so we can identify a geodesic with its endpoints. Um, so we're gonna do that. The, that's one of the abuses of notation that's gonna happen <laughs> here is that series is a little bit more carefully, um, is we just refer to the geodesic as its endpoints. Um, also, I know the slides here, I have the tech version. If anyone knows how to make tech, make those brackets the correct size when there's a line break. I, Stack Exchange was that helpful. Love to know. Um, okay, so after we identify the geodesic with its endpoints, we can also use that the unit tangent vector is uniquely defined now by the endpoints, not just by the geodesic. So that's where the really hard core of using notation is, is that we induce maps on the unit tangent bundle from maps on geodesics, which in turn are induced for maps on the endpoints. And since all of those are identifications, aside from one geodesic, uh, which I will discuss, it's, it's stereogonic theory, one geodesic measures here, throw it out. Um, everything works nicely and we just abuse some notation. So have more pictures. So this is the not glued up version of 
the surface. So this bottom edge would be folded in half. <laughs> uh, and I, so I have, I have both versions drawn here. This is the version that's isometric though. Um, and this black line is the image of that, of the imaginary axis, uh, which is all of the edges of the fairy tessellation. And then I've drawn a very small part of a geodesic here, and the green is the unit tangent bundle. I'm not sure how great on different screens that shows up, but seems okay on mine. And what we're going to do is technically, if you want to prove everything, you need to be working talking about these unit tangent bundle uh, vectors here. Um, and I also am going to use them to orient our geodesics. <laughs> So here, what we want is we want to keep track of where the cusp is. So this end is cusp in relation to this geodesic. So the cusp here is if we stand facing the head of the arrow, the cusp is on our left. And in our next picture, I have a couple more, though this is in the glued up version. Um, if we start here, this is our start. We wrap around, well, either rotate the image of your head or stand on your head. The, or I guess rotate your screen. Uh, cusp is on your right, so I have an R. And then it goes dot, dot, dot. Behind here, this is the next place. And so this is one, two. It's still on the right, nothing's changed. Uh, and then it comes, I don't know how clear that is here, down here and around and comes through the bottom. So the next time we cross this line, that's the image of the imaginary axis, the cusp is now on the left. So wrapping around that bottom is how, one way, probably the only way, to actually change what side of the geodesic the cusp occurs on. I have another picture. Just some more. So now we start here. I think the slight green didn't, dark green didn't show up as well. We start here and wrap around. The cusp is on the left. Wrap around, cusp is still on the left. So this is two. And then it kind of comes be goes behind before going under the under the bottom of the pillow thing. And then the cusp ends up on the right. Now this is the like just this is what's going on, on the actual surface. And I get a lot when I've tried to talk about this without these pictures, I've had a lot of questions of like, why is this relevant? And so this is drawing the actual surface, kind of trying to show what's going on. Um, but we are going to not work with these pictures because they're very hard to, very long to draw. Um, gonna go back here. <laughs> um, so again, A is the set of geodesics. I think the online slides, I, that's an S, but it, it should be A. They're identified with each other, so that should be an A. Is a set of geodesics with endpoints either starting, um, in the case I've drawn here, in this blue area between minus one and zero, and then ending, so following this arrow, ending with greater than one, or we reflect everything. So that's the only difference between the two cases. It, makes the math very nice. All you have to do is multiply everything by minus one. So pictures from here out, on out, I believe are this case. There might be, I might have thrown in another one. Uh, so what we're going to do here is now figure out how the lefts and rights translate in this picture. And so now all of these black lines are images so that like sides, of the tessellation that I think is doubling the wrong letter. You'd think by now I could spell that word. Uh, so the tessellation are images 
of the imaginary axis under PSL uh, 2Z. So, all right, that was the black line we were marking on the surface itself. And so now when the geodesic crosses the cell, this, these hyperbolic triangles, it crosses two sides of the cell that meet at a vertex. And we're going to do the same thing, is whether that vertex now, because that, that is what gets mapped to the cusp when you do all the identifications. It's whether that vertex is on the left or the right. So this one is on the right. So I have some pictures of what we have, the different, most of the different side, um, types that we'll get. So this top one is almost what we had before, but now we're facing down. And so if you actually, if I turn screen lock off, can I convince it to flip upside down? No. All right. Well, I tried to see if I could fo force it to do it, but. <laughs> um, so this is on the left here. And these vertical ones are kind of the harder ones to figure out. Um, is these are the two sides. And then your vertex is way off at infinity. So this one is on the left. And this is on the right. And now we have an example that for me, mine's now gone in black and white. I don't know if that happened to anyone else. Um, where we start here and we hit these first two sides and the vertex is on the left. come across here, and now this is a vertex uh, zero. So on the right, let's darken this. So this one we have left is off at infinity. We come down here, the right, and then all of these that are drawn left, the rest of the ones that are drawn, um, yeah, I don't, I think flipping it up and back maybe upset it. <laughs> I don't know why it's this thing. Um, okay. One person All of these. said, um, so Ethan Farber said that uh, when this problem has happened to him, he's disconnected and reconnected his tablet. I think things are readable, but suboptimal. That's So, cause I'm also looking at it on my desktop and there's like ghost images. <laughs> I assume that's what's happening to other people as well. Um, let me. Just images. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Okay, the ghost images are gone. That that blue line is real. <laughs> it, was, it was just faint, so I drew on top of it. Okay. Hopefully that helped. Um, yeah. So if we go through here. Hopefully this one is a little bit more visible. You start here, gamma minus, gamma plus, and keep in mind, so this first one is the vertex that we care about is minus one. And then the next one, the two sides meet at zero. And we have two sides that meet at infinity and two sides that meet at one. So now we've kind of started to twist to standing, maybe not on our head yet. And then all of the rest meet at two, all the rest that I've drawn. And then the other thing is, I'm doubling my colors, maybe I'll put this in black. Um, we wanna mark, I think I put this on an earlier slide, we wanna mark where we cross the imaginary axis and look at that unit tangent vector. Mostly that's for if you want to actually prove things correctly, that's the space you need to work in. 
but it does, it's not as necessary for the pictures. There you go. So here's another picture. This is the one from this, this previous slide where I have a dot, dot, dot. And again, we start here. Uh, and our first two sections cross sides that meet at zero. And then we hit the imaginary, so these are both ours. Then we hit the imaginary axis. And we do need to keep track of that. That's gonna act as our like, zero in the infinite sequence. And then all of these where we cross vertical lines are L's. And there are N1 minus two L's between two and N1. Uh, N1. And then it comes down. And that, if you want to prove things, is an important part, point to mark. But if you just want to draw the pictures, it's less important. We have a right and a left. So this is kind of a good place to think, OK, where did the continued fractions go? And how are they coming back? So the continued fraction expansion of gamma minus infinity is just looking at the picture between minus a half and 0. So the first digit of the CF, the continued fraction, is at least two. And if we want to look at this other endpoint, we know it's between N1 and N1 plus 1. And actually, it's between n1 plus a half and n1 plus 1, for, again, from the picture. Um, and so we know, if I write it here, gamma plus infinity, then n1 plus a half, n1 plus 1. And so it's going to look like gamma plus infinity, n1 plus well, anything from way back those earlier slides, anything between a half and one, the first digit of the continuing fraction is one. And then we don't know anything beyond that because I stop drawing the pictures because they get, they get really small really fast. And this is where our, our first theorem comes in. Um, and I'm actually going to be proper here and the full theorem. Um, so I said before we can kind of identify geodesics with their unit tangent vectors, with their endpoints, all of these things. Um, so the first thing is that this map from the geodesics, uh, these with endpoints starting between minus one and zero and being greater than one or their reflection. Um, and identifying that with these unit tangent vectors um, where the cutting sequence, so the sequence of L's and M, R's, switches um, from L to R or R to L at the base point. Um, so uh, I'm going to do the upper half wave version. So exactly where I've marked psi gamma and eta gamma. Um, so the, that's our set X, is the things like psi gamma, eta gamma, and the unit tangent vectors there. Um, so this map that's just projecting um, from the upper half plane to M is uh, surjective, continuous, and open. And then we have one place where it's not injective, and that is the geodesic between uh, 1 and minus 1 with either orientation uh, has the same image. And that's actually that seam 
on uh, the television and of the, the picture. So then the other thing is we need continued fractions. So we have two options for geodesics. First option, first bullet point is the picture I've been drawing, which is that, right, we have, I'll scroll up here so you can kind of see where I wrote down what we have here. Um, you write down this whole sequence of lefts and rights, keeping track of where the imaginary axis is. And we can write down the continued fraction expansion, just reading off the exponents. So for this gamma minus infinity, uh, the negative one, we start here and read this way. And it, we know it's between minus one and zero, so we put minus sign out front. And then for the other one, we start here and read forwards. And we just have, I wrote the notation here for anything that was a contained fraction to be between zero and one. So we have n dot plus dot dot dot. And if we look up with what the previous slide, it kind of fits with what we said it had to be. So there's not enough information here to really say this is at least two. It looks like it probably is two. It looks, but it could be bigger. And then this other one is n1 plus one, and r, we have r1 here. And then the picture was getting small, so we stopped drawing them. And then the other option is that we multiply everything by minus one. Um, and the only thing is that the L's and R's are switched in that situation, which if you think about it, I normally do this in front of the screen, but pick something on your left and think about if you turn and face the other direction, it's now on your right and vice versa. So this one is going to be R n minus one L n minus one psi gamma R naught. And one. So this is really nice um, that we have these two different symbolic systems and we can translate between them. And one thing that's really uh, that one reason we want to do this is that uh, the geodesic flow on on the unit tangent bundle of the modular surface uh, has some nice properties and it allows us to prove things. But before we prove things, more examples, because this is confusing. Uh, so some of these I've teched the letters in, some of them are small, but I have the advantage of being able to zoom in here so we could see them a little better. So if we start here, right, we start, no, nope, there we go. I'll make sure that, try not to do that. All right, we cross these two sides. And our geodesic is oriented you know, this way. So that is on our left. Um, and then the next two are on our right, which are already marked. And I already marked the imaginary axis so we can zoom out. And we have right, the sides up here. So we kind of tilt to see that's on our left on our left, and then we curve back down, and we're looking at these two slides, the two sides, and since the geodesic is facing down, that will end up being on the right if you like turn your head or whatever around so that you can face the same direction as the geodesic, and then we have all of the rest of them are going to meet at three, or all the rest that have been drawn are going to meet at three. And so that means that our cutting, the part that we could see of our cutting sequence is going to have an L, two R's, the imaginary axis, L squared, R, L cubed. And so gamma minus infinity 
is going to have continued fraction expansion that starts 3, 1, and then we don't have enough information to continue. And gamma plus infinity is going to start 2, 1, 3, and then again, um, we don't have enough information to continue. Um, Continuing fractions converge to real numbers quickly. Um, and one consequence of that is that these triangles get very small very fast. So now we need to actually talk about like proving some things or if you wanted to work with this or something, why is this true? It, like it's nice, but why is this? Why, why do these things behave the way we want them to? Uh, and so we define some action on the endpoints of the geodesic. Remember, that's going to induce things to where you actually have theorems, uh, which is just 1 over A1. Uh, this is what happens when you pull slides from multiple sources. These are ends. I guess we can just have A1 is the floor of the absolute value of gamma infinity in general for both case one and two. So this almost looks like what we had back with the Gauss map. There's something with that floor function and subtraction. It doesn't look that similar. So. Um, but it, it's kind of similar. And so you get something that like this. So we start with this first geodesic and when you apply rho, it changes orientation. So we're going to bounce between the two cases and we also want to see what that does to symbolics, um, because that's where we've been able to connect to continued fractions. And we move one down the sequence, right? So we move this L1, L T N1 shifts down. So it kind of acts like a shift map again. Uh, and so that's where then, of course, if you wanted to actually do this for real, you would you know, prove that all of that is true. And then if we want to deal with the other case where we've reflected across the imaginary axis, you put a minus sign in the correct place and everything else behaves nicely. And since it's in our picture, I'll note that psi of rho gamma is equal to the eta gamma. That kind of looks like an eta. It's equal to the eta gamma in the picture. So this is for the geometers out here, there, this is the first return map to x, um, which is our cross section. So everything is actually behaving very correctly in that three dimensional unit tangent bundle that we can't draw. So I kind of like to, because I am actually wanting to do ergodic theory to the natural extension and not just uh, the gas front. I kind of throw series X2 theorems together um, and get this squished thing. So uh, basically we have that we have this map on X, right, which is a subset of our unit tangent bundle. And if we project correctly, it commutes with our natural extension. So, um, and here our projection is just that we need the sine of x raised with plus or minus one, and we need to go into the unit interval. And then it's one over x uh, for x and just make y positive. <laughs> All right, so when x is positive, this is just taking minus 1, 0 to 0, 1 in the y. When x is negative, then it doesn't do anything to y. Um, and then this all commutes, so we're able to push through nice, nice facts here. Uh, 
since this is a space, x is a space we understand. That should give us, yes. So the invariant measure in some coordinates, apparently non standard coordinates for the geodesic flow, is just, you know, d alpha d beta d theta over alpha minus one, alpha minus beta quantity squared. And so when you push through the commutativity, um, because our projection map is invertible or is order two, we already know it's inverses. So we can just plug it in, do some calculus, and you get um, dx dy over xy plus one quantity squared. You do some more calculus and you get that the weight is log two. Um, and then we can project again, which is just integrating. Um, to actually get that. So d mu is invariant for it's an actual extension. And this is invariant for the Gauss map, which you can also prove using a kind of slick infinite series argument. Um, and then the geodesic flow um, with this invariant measure is ergodic um, due to a uh, hop argument. So uh, ergodicity pushes through commutative diagrams. So we get that these maps are also ergodic, which is really nice because that is hard to prove <laughs> uh, for symbolic systems in general. Um, and we can get some number theory too, just for people who want some number theory here. Um, so we get uh, a, another classification of quadratic irrationals. So that would be, um, I realized for the ergodic theorists, that would be um, quadratic irrational, irrational is a root of ax squared plus dx plus c. And so then we have pairs, alpha and alpha bar are roots of the same quadratic equation or quadratic polynomial if we have this relationship between the two uh, contained fraction expansions. Of course, not all pairs are going to fall with one greater than one and the other one uh, between zero and one, but the purely periodic ones uh, will. And then we also have that at, at some point the continuing fraction will start uh, repeating, if and only if it's the root of a quadratic polynomial, that's a little bit more classic. There are other ways to prove that as well, but you can get this from the behavior on the modular surface. Um, you also get a measurement between those two points where it changes. Um, so, oh, it was, where's my last time I had a picture? Here, between psi and eta. So you can actually use the continuous factor expansion to get the hyperbolic length there. Um, and then if you have a closed geodesic, which is one where it comes back to where it started, which means that we are in this case, right, because we have a purely periodic continued fraction expansion, that's going to be the same as eventually the geodesic comes back to where it started, then of course the sequence is going to have to start repeating. Um, the length of that entire geodesic can also be computed using um, these rows. So here the, the prime is, is truly your derivative. And that is that is what I have on here. I have, I have, wait, I have any animations that I didn't show yet. If hopefully this isn't gonna make it freak out with, the, with anything. Um, this should be on. My mouse on the correct screen. There. 
So I know animations do not always come through great in screen sharing, um, but if it does, this is a nice, when I press play, um, animation by Edmund Harris and Pierre Anu that kind of shows, so the blue lines here are the edges of your fundamental domain. So these are all copies of that original fundamental domain. And so there's only one red point, and then the, all of the others are just images of that same red point under the PSL2 action. So if you want to actually see what this geodesic flow looks like, I will attempt to convince it to start. There we go. I, yeah, I know, depending on the internet connection, this may or may not come through great. It gets more exciting in a second. So you could see kind of maybe um, as it goes up into the cusp, the, if you look at the little ones, it also is making these nice little circles down at the bottom. And that, that I think I cut it off after the best part. Yeah. So that one, that the last one's really nice. And so I think John said he put the actual link to where this is. I recorded part of it. Um, so it would be easier to share, um, especially because it's not super mobile friendly, but uh, it's fun. It, it goes on for longer. It's fun to watch. But that is, that is all. I'm used to 50 minutes, so ask me many questions. Yeah, so if people have questions, you can put them into chat. Um, Well, uh, I'm not seeing any questions, so I think I, I yeah. hope everybody will join me in think, thanking Claire. Um, oh, I think Anya just asked yeah. a question. How efficient are the uh, lines? In um, I think the length addition, I mean, I think the length computation, I did not do the, uh, the actual, okay. The animations I did not do. The uh, drawings themselves were done in Mathematica. So for everything except for the animation was Mathematica, including the modular pillow, um, which again, I did not. That one was Steve Trestle, but I, it is Mathematica. Um, the animation is shader toy and I don't know. I, you have to look at the code itself. I just emailed Edwin and Pierre and asked if they were okay with me sharing it with people because I really liked it. Um, but that is the extent of my knowledge of how it was made. Um, and if you actually go to the Shader Toy link, uh, you can read the code yourself. It's not like, but I, I don't, I think, think, yeah, I, I don't read code enough to tell you exactly how they're calculating it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but everything else is Mathematica. It's actually, you can either hard code yourself or download ways to make it you, where you put in the endpoints of the geodesic and it just draws a semicircle uh, by telling it to calculate the midpoint and the radius and then drawing it. Uh, so, and then fairy fractions are, are already in, are an existing function you can call in Mathematica. So it's not, uh, it, it's actually pretty 
relative to Mathematica, it's pretty fast. Um, for the modular surface, it really helps if you know someone who's already coded it and then you can code from there. So uh, yeah, other questions. Hopefully, I'm hoping those pillows, oh, the, the tail, yes, I can see that. Um, so if you have like alpha is N1, This is eventually repeats. Say we get to like Ni and then it goes to Nr and this repeats. So this is the same notation from decimals repeating. This is if and only if alpha is the root of a quadratic. Uh, one direction of this is actually not too bad to prove just using, just writing down the continued fraction expansion. Um, I debated making my undergrads do it. I didn't. Uh, the other direction is apparently hard. I've never tried proving it just from the continued fraction expansion, though, without any geometry to help. Uh, but the other grad number theory textbook that I'm using says it's hard to do. Uh, there's a reasonably nice proof in uh, Hinchin's continued fraction book, and it goes under the name Lagrange. Right, yeah. Does it yeah, depend at all just... on the backwards endpoint? No, no, no. I didn't mention that. Hi, Anton. Um, Hi. <laughs> um, if you go, where's the picture? I'll pull up a picture. Um, no, so this is a thing that's like very weird. And is that, and I should have said it because it is weird, is the once you have that the sequences start to coincide, it doesn't actually matter like what the backwards endpoint was. So you can move any like this to the right of the imaginary axis and to the left of the imaginary axis independently. And I don't have a nice thing that I can move around, but the picture. If I had, oh, I might be able to create a nice picture. If we think about like this, I have a full circle because that's what the iPad wants to do. And like this one endpoint is fixed. You can move this other endpoint around and it's not going to actually change. But it seems like whether or not the geodesic is periodic will change. Oh, whether or not the geodesic itself is periodic? Yeah, the tail, yeah, the, the, the forward the tail, it, it'll be like approximately periodic in the limit or something. Is that right? So the geodesic can't be periodic unless both endpoints are. So right, so the, the have, statement that the tail is yeah. periodic, if and only if the endpoint is a quadratic irrational, that's not like exactly true? Uh, wait. The tail of the... Sorry, yeah, this should be of the continued fraction. This is not of the. Oh, so okay, it'll okay, okay. Like, yeah, yeah. There's a word missing. Yep. This 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 slide is from my defense. I'm not. Hi, Claire. Can uh, I hop in real quick? Yeah, Joe. How dear co-author understand? <laughs> uh, I was just going to answer it. The question is, if the forward endpoint is periodic, but the backwards one, who knows? Um, then you know at the very least you do converge towards a periodic geodesic, even if you don't necessarily ever actually be a periodic geodesic. That, okay, that sounds right. That makes sense, yeah. I think maybe the operative uh, word is that it should be eventually periodic, right? It doesn't matter what the continued fraction does at first, it just eventually has to be periodic. Uh, the geodesic doesn't it, become eventually periodic. Yeah. Because it's, yeah, yeah there, there will still be a disconnect unless you have the exact right geodesic that, uh, that matches up there. Yeah, that's the more standard phrasing. Um, this is, I believe, the phrasing I pulled from the series. But yeah, that would be the more standard way of phrasing it. Uh, length of closed geodesics. A lot of derivatives. 
Um, so this is, we have that row is this. I'm going to want both of these. So if we are saying alpha and alpha minus alpha bar you're, are the two endpoints, then row is n1 minus x row n1 or row composed with itself and two minus x and then row to the two r comes back to being uh no that there's one more step right this is n two r minus x and then you take derivatives it's it's annoying <laughs> Um, but it's made, I mean, I think the matrix, it, I think actually throwing matrices in instead of writing it this way, but then actually doing, uh, that should be a minus one. This way of writing it maybe helps a little bit. I can pull up, apparently I closed it. Um, I can pull up the actual series paper, but I don't think there's much more details going on given. Uh, here. Okay. I can look at my file organization. That's fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, da -da 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 sources series. There we go. So it's a couple of pages to do the calculation. It's not like immediate. Ooh, I think I went too far. Yeah. So we end up with this kind of long thing. I don't know if I can zoom in. And it's possible. Did I use the same notation? But the other thing you could do is there's some nice trick. The trick picture here um, is another way of, doing, of kind of getting all of this stuff going. I think that might be on this page. But yeah, so you actually, I, a big thing I think Maybe it's not quite what Anton was asking, but um, no, I think it wasn't what Anton was asking, but this whole, the independence of the forward and backwards uh, endpoints is like actually a pretty big thing that was, that's part of this paper um, that I kind of didn't need for what I was saying, but it is actually a, an important lemma that I'm really glad I don't have to reprove and I can cite. Although it's, I mean, it's not. A hard proof. That's most of it right there. But nope, that was all of it. Yeah. So this is. I mean, you get a lot. Of, I just pulled pulled some of it. You get a lot of number theory out of this as well. So if there's other no other questions, questions, I hope everyone will join me in thanking Claire. Um, I will also advertise that next week's talk is given by, will be given by Dominic. And lastly, I'll leave this up for another about 10 minutes in case people want to advertise anything in the chat. That's a good place or even just chat with each other. Um, you have functions where you can pick individual people to chat with or you can write things yeah. to everybody. Um, so thanks Claire for giving such a great talk and I'll now turn off the recording. Yeah.